Okay, welcome to Christian Bible Chapel. We want to thank the Lord. We're live on YouTube as well as on Facebook. We thank the Lord. We are continuing our series in the sovereignty of God. And at this point, we are on chapter 8, the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. Right. We're going to combine the uh, overview. Well, we're going to go over. We go over from uh, chapter 7 dealing with the human will and today the human responsibility in our lesson today. So with that in mind, two passages of scriptures, again, we want you to look at, and that's Romans chapter 14. Let me see, I think I had that. Let's see. Huh? Yes, the book of Romans, chapter 14. We gave that scripture last week, but this is another one. Uh, we're going to look at two symbols. Okay, verses 9. No, verse 11. Romans 14, 11. And John Gospel chapter uh, 6. We're going to look at Romans chapter 14 first. Let's look to the Lord in prayer and pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us in the teaching of the word. Father, we thank you as we bow before you and give an honor and glory to you. We thank you for all things. We know that you understand and knows all things because you are the sovereign God. You sees all, you knows all, you are aware of. And nothing can happen and will happen or has happened unless you have allowed it. And we're gracious, Father that you are the almighty God. And we pray now as we study the word of God, that as the people of God, your Holy Spirit will give us wisdom, knowledge and understanding of the word. If there by chance, Lord, if there's an unbeliever listening, that the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin and cause them to call upon the name of the Lord before it's too late. We ask this, Lord, that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding may be given to us as your people to know the truths of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at Romans chapter 14. Everybody got that? Romans 14, uh, verse 11. You can read with me. It says this, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, And every tongue shall confess to God. Look at verse 12. So then every one of us Shall give an account of themselves to God. Accountability. Accountability, being corporal, corporal of your sin, accountable for your sin, responsible for your sin. The solving God and human responsibility. All right. Now, when we when we look at it, we ask the question because it is so important that even we who are believers who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And to those who are not saved, we must know that sin is the issue, it's the problem. It is the, it is the issue, it is the problem. Because the wages 
of sin is death. All humans everywhere are responsible for their sin. Okay? Now, the question we want to look at, and we're going to pick up on that statement, is how can the sinner be responsible for the doing of what one is incapable or unable to do? Let me read that again. How can the sinner be held responsible for the doing of what one is unable to do? And how can the sinner be justly condemned for not doing what he could not do? All right? These particular questions more or less will be addressed by the unrighteous before their sentence is given to them at the last day at the last judgment. Because they are saying, even as they say right now, it's not fair. It's not fair. To understand that, we, owe, we, we, we turn our attentions to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 5, I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Read with me. Wherefore by one man sin entered into the world. Okay, that person is Adam. Let me make this try and make this so plain. When God made Adam, God put Adam in control of everything. He is the Lord of Earth. Adam's control of the Lord of the Earth, and not only that, but all his prosperity, his ancestry, lies on his shoulder. Okay? Now understand that. Any person that's born into this world after Adam, because Adam was created, we are born. Abel, Cain, all the way down to us today, we are born into this world. And in that being born, we inherited Adam's sin. And so this is where people say, why am I held responsible for what Adam did? Romans 5 and 12, wherefore by one man sin entered into the world and death is by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Now what that means is from Abel all the way down, from Cain and Abel all the way down to us today and even in the future, all who was born into this world as a human being, they are infected. I don't like using the word infected. <laughs> in other words, we are we are we're rooted radically depraved okay, in sin. It doesn't matter. You, the baby that comes out is a sinner. All have sinned. We're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It's not what we do or don't do that makes us a sinner. We are a sinner because of our born being born into this world. And once again, people are saying, well, why is that a problem? Because it was Adam. The scripture goes on in verse 14. It says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned 
after the likeness of Adam's transgression. See that? See, it says the similitude or the likeness of Adam's transgression. We may not have done what Adam did by, by disobeying God and eating the fruit. Adam plunged the whole human race, his prosperity, his ancestry. What Adam did caused all humans to be inflicted with sin. This is what verse 14 it says. And through his offense, all are made guilty of sin. Then Paul illustrates, he lets us know that, verse 15, but not as the offense, so is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of mercy, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abound unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. So for judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Jesus is a, is a prototype of Adam. Because of one man, sin fell upon the whole human race. Here comes Jesus through his death on the cross. The forgiveness of sins can be granted to those who repent of their sin. What God is calling all people to do is to repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ who died on the cross for their sin. This is what Paul is bringing out. So because of one man's offense, judgment came upon all men, verse 18. Even so, by the righteousness of one man, Jesus, the free gift can become upon all who repents. The question is, is that, well, not a question, but the, 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 the problem exists is that sin afflicts us. We're born in sin so rooted in sin and shaped in iniquity. The scripture declares that. Right. So because of that, it does not wipe away or get rid of the question about sin in our lives. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. In the statement, we gotta learn, we're learning from scriptures how that God is holding everyone accountable for their sin. And that through only through Jesus' death on the cross and through forgiveness of sins by coming to Jesus, can your sin be forgiven? Only through Jesus. Not through works, church membership, religion, or anything else. Only through Jesus Christ. And you have the forgiveness of sin. When you don't have forgiveness of sins, you will perish. Because the wages of the sin is death. Now, We ask the question, how can the sinner be held responsible for doing what one is unable to do? So you say, well, I'm not able to come to God. I'm not able to seek God, come to God, repent, 
believe God because I'm a sinner. That does not deviate. That does not erase the point that you still are born in sin. You may not pick up a finger to hurt anyone or cause any slander or judged anyone or hated anyone, but the mere fact of each of us being born into the world, that causes us to be a sinner. And the problem is we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And we got to give accountable to God for our sin. Romans 5 says there's only one way out of this. There's only one way out of this. And that through Jesus Christ. Not through the Pope or religious people or dignitaries, government, works, religion activities, church activities. Of any sort is by grace alone are you saved through faith that not of yourselves is the gift of God. God has to give a gift. God grants salvation to us by means of a gift through Jesus Christ, death on the cross. All who come to him will be saved. Now, since I used the word come, that's why we told you to turn to John chapter 6. So let's turn to John chapter 6. Any questions right now? Now, here we have the discourse of Jesus relating to the people that he is declaring that he is the true bread of God. In other words, there was bread sent from God to people. It was called manna, and they ate and fed themselves. But that bread couldn't give you eternal life. It only could sustain you for a while. Jesus says, I am the living bread. Whosoever eat of me and drink shall live forever. So he changed it from a physical nourishment of the human flesh to a spiritual means of being born again or saved so that you can spend eternity with God. Now with that in mind, let's pick up in chapter 6 of, of uh, John's Gospel, starting at verse 32. Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, notice that. I want you to highlight it or circle the world. See that? In, at the end of verse 33, it says, that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now what we have to pinpoint through scriptures now, not human knowledge or intelligence or our own understanding, we got to see the true definition for the word world. Did Jesus die for the whole human race, for everyone? That's the ultimate question. If we don't answer that correctly, then we can't understand John 3.16 because the same word is there for God so loved the world. So we got to understand. Whom does God love? Whom did Jesus die for? If Jesus died for everyone, there's no need for anyone perishing. That erases the word, whosoever believe in him, whosoever believes not in him shall perish. So what is the point in John 3, 16 for, the, for Jesus saying, okay, I don't want to misquote it. 
Let me get it. It's an easy scripture, but I really don't want to misquote it. And you can really misquote things here. So it says, in, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, only and one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, we, we read scriptures, we hear it preach, but we really don't have a un true understanding. We have an understanding of it. We have a vague understanding because of what has been told us instead of what the scriptures is actually saying. The word there, for God so loved the world, again, highlight that or circle it, the world, as in John 6, 33. The world, the sun came down from heaven, the bread of God is he that came down from heaven to give his life for the world. What is, who are the world? Is it everybody? If it is, then it doesn't make sense with the rest of the verse, John 3, 16, when it says, whosoever believes in him shall not perish. So what's the condemnation? What's perish for? If Jesus died on the cross for everyone, there's no such thing as a person perishing because he died for everybody. Well, you say, well, there are some people that's not going to believe. Well, then, that they are part of the world, right? They're part of mankind, right? You're saying that Jesus died for everybody. No, no, what I'm saying, no, you said that Jesus died for everybody on the cross. On the cross, he died for everybody. So if he died for everybody, there's no need for a person to die in their sins or to perish. But what John 3.16 is saying is that there are some who will not believe, who will not come. So that brings us back to John chapter 6 again. Look at verse 37. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whosoever comes to me, I will never drive them away. This is the NIV. If you're reading from the King James, it's the similar words. It's, it's the similar words. It's, it's no changing. If you want me to read from John, um, uh, the, the King James, I can read from that. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. All right, same words. So, we are at a, a point in which we have to realize that there will be those who will resist God, reject God, go on in their way, and die in their sins. That's a horrible fact. I wish it couldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't happen, but the reality is, it's true. But we have to understand this, first of all, that all mankind is born in sin. And in that sin, all mankind is responsible for their sin. We inherited from Adam. We read the scriptures in Romans chapter 5, 12 through 18. It's right there. But because all are born in sin and shaped in iniquity, Psalms 51, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. It's, it's, so hard, it's so gripping here. What must I do then be saved? 
Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. But the, the point is, man is so radically rooted in sin, depraved by sin, being born in sin. If I'm a sinner, how can I come? How can I seek God? How can I know God? See, that's, that's the, the dilemma in the human existence in our lives. But in our text here, John 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. What that means is there are certain individuals whom God chooses to spend eternity with him. See, when we started this lesson, when we started this lesson way back in chapter 1 in dealing with defining the sovereignty of God Defining the word sovereignty and what it means that God is sovereign. He knows all. Everything that, ha that had happened, will happen, is happening. God knew it. He allowed it. He wanted it. Because he is God. That's what being sovereign means. You have everything under control. No molecule, no, no, no mediator, no, no mediator in this space. Nothing, all what we read about in past history, all what had happened, happened because God allowed it. It could not happen unless God do allow it. Because he saw it. Yes, he could have prevented and stopped Adam from eating the fruit and being disobedient. But that's his choosing. He allowed, he allowed sin to come into the world. He allowed sin to come into the universe. He allowed you to be born, me to be born. In whatever city, state, district, country you are in, he allowed you to be part of the family that you are part of. What is going on in your life, what you are thinking in your heart, what you are doing in your life, God knew. He allowed. Just as every person is born into this world, there are certain individuals whom God allows to hear the truth, know the truth, come to the truth, and get saved. Now that is such a very difficulty and, and a hard concept for the human mind to accept because we feel that we are free moral agents and we have the ability to choose and not to choose. And no one is questioning that. We do have the, the moral ability as we see, look over here, man's ability. The word abilities mean the possession of means or skill to do something. Your ability to do something. Uh, we have a natural ability. All humans have a natural ability that we're born with to do ordinary or ex ex expected things or unexpected things. That's a natural ability like a natural talent. We also have a moral ability to be able to do according to our conscience. That's moral ability. Number one, natural ability. Number two, a moral ability. These two abilities we do have. And yet, as we so stated, it is still tainted by sin. But we still, even though we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity, we still have the moral ability to do 
according to our own conscience. Even though we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity, we still have the natural ability to do ordinary things, unexpected things, extraordinary things. But here lies the point. There's a supernatural, that, excuse me, there's a spiritual ability, number three, in which that spiritual ability is able us to please God, come to God, and know God. That, number three, spiritual ability we do not have. We have a natural abilities, we have moral abilities. Even though they're tainted by sin. But because of our sinfulness. We do not have. Number three. The spiritual ability. That is. The ability to come to God. To know God. To seek God. We don't have. We're not born with it. Because we're born in sin. And shaped in iniquity. If we are born with a spiritual ability, then we have no problem in pleasing God and knowing God. But we don't. This is the reason why Jesus says three times in this one chapter, now look at verse uh, 44, John 4, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me Draw them, and I will raise them up at the last day. No one has the ability. See, that ability is the spiritual ability. No one has the spiritual ability to come to God. Though we have moral ability, though we have a natural ability, we don't have a spiritual ability. Look at verse 60, uh, it's the last one here. Look at the verse uh, 60, 65. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father enables them. He has to draw you because we don't have the spiritual ability. Now remember the last time, under the subject of human will, we stipulated how that our will is so tainted by sin that we can't, we do not have the ability, the spiritual ability, to come to God. So God, unless God intervenes, in our lives and cause us to see the horrible condition of sin unless God intervene in your life, my life and anyone else's life and wake them up they will continue to be dead in trespasses and sin. That's why it's repeatedly says in John 6 no one has the ability unless this brings us to also John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 3. Okay. Hope you're taking notes on that because it is so vital and important because when you as a believer speak to someone about salvation, you need to let them know that they need to repent of their sins and trust Jesus as their Savior. John 3 and 3 says, Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say to you, no one, no one, no one can see the kingdom of God. No one. John 3 and 3. No one. Jesus says, answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, that person, he, she, cannot 
cannot, does not have the ability, that's what it is, to see the kingdom of God. Now the question I'm asking you is, class, is why? Why can't they? Because of what? S, I, N. We're born in sin. Unless a person, see that word in, in your King James, John 3 and 3 says, except a man. In the Greek, the word is unless. Unless means there must be a necessary condition. Something must be met in order for you to be born again. And it's not by works. It's nothing you can do. Because John 1 already clarified that in John 1, uh, 11, when it says this, uh, verse 12, but as many as receive him, to them gave the person the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, St. John 1, 13, which were born not of blood. See, that's, that was the problem in Jesus' days tremendously with the Jews because they felt that because they are Jews, that made them tight with God, that they, ought, that, that they felt they already had the ticket to go to heaven because they're Jews. And this is the reason why you have people of various colors or ethnic races want to become a Hebrew. You know, a black person say, I'm a black Hebrew. Or a white person say, oh, I'm a nationalist Jewish. And another person says in India, I'm a Hebrew. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the... No, it's not a blood. So you can go on and take all the religious attire and the religious ceremony to become a Jew. That is not going to get you to heaven. You're not really a, a, a Jew in the sight of God unless you believe like Abraham, and Abraham believed God. And all Jews do not believe God. The God of, that's why he said I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Are you a true Jew? A true Jew will accept, receive Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. If you say you're a Jew, and you in synagogue on Saturdays, have you trusted in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah? God in flesh dying on the cross for your sin. You say, no. Well, you're not a true Jew then. But Abraham is my father. No, he's not your father. You may claim Abraham as your nationality, as your ethnic, whatever, religious background, but you're not true. And that's why Jesus confronted these Jews in John chapter 8. If Abraham was your father, you will love me because I came from God. Abraham didn't do this. You seek to kill me. We are born of, at least we are born of fornication. We are of God. Jesus says, no, you're not. What are you talking to me about? I am a Jew. Jesus says you are not a true Jew. If you was a true Jew, you would be free. What do you mean free? This is Rome, This is John chapter 8 now. This is John chapter 8 when Jesus is talking to them. Right. So Jesus says in John chapter 8, because see, you got a lot of people that are highly religious. They believe as Muslims and Islamic and whatever, Jesus is a great prophet and Jesus is this and Jesus is a great prophet, I'm a Jew and I don't know, Jesus is not the Messiah but he's a great man, he's a great prophet and I'm a child of Abraham and I, Jesus says, no you're not. They didn't understand what he was, was talking to them. So he told them in verse 39, if Abraham... If you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. You're looking for a way to kill me, a man who have told you the truth. 
And this truth I heard from God. Abraham did not such things. You are doing the works of your father. Then they cried out, well, at least we're not born illegitimate. We got God as our father. If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God. I did not come on my own, but God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? You know why you don't understand me? Because you are of your father, the devil, not Abraham. You want to carry out your father's will. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, and he told, holds not the truth. For there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks untruth. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? See, all these Jews were surrounded. So you have Jews in Israel, Jews in America, Jews over here, Jews there. And they're saying that we are of Abraham. Our God is our God. You, you don't know, Jesus says, woman, you don't know who you're worshiping. Jews, you don't really know who you're worshiping. If you have not received Jesus as the Messiah, that Jesus, the very Jesus of Nazareth, as the Christ, the Messiah, then you're not truly a Jew. You may be nationally, skin-wise, nationwide a Jew, but you're not truly a Jew. Let's back up. Verse 31. Uh, Roman, uh, John chapter 8, verse 31. So there were Jews who believed on Jesus. John 8, 31. Jesus says, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They say, we are of Abraham's descendant and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we as Jews will be set free? Verily, verily, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. Now, a slave has no place in the family, but the son belongs to it, the family forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me. See, remember, okay. Now, I'm, 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 I'm clarifying because I know a lot of you may work among Jews, you may be in a Jewish business, you may come in contact with people who are Islamic, who are Muslims, people of various religion and they pat themselves on the back because they say we're the best, we're the chosen one of God. No, you're not. The only ones that are chosen of God, hear me now, the only one according to the scriptures who are the chosen of God are those only if they have repented of their sins and trusted Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, Savior of the world. Right? So we're not free. You're still slave to sin. But if you come to the Son, He will make you free, and you will be free indeed. You can still be a church member wrapped up in activities. You may be wrapped up in religious, religious works and activity and still be bondage to sin. Because all are born into this world, rooted in sin, you're bondage and slave to sin. And the only way you can have true freedom is through Jesus Christ. We work as human beings so hard to get out of slavery that we have no idea that we're still slavery to sin. That's the slavery we need to get out of. And the only way you can get out of slavery 
of sin is through Jesus Christ, not through psychology, not through philosophy, religion, good works, honorable deeds, being mild-mannered, kind and honest, church goer, religious activity, a religious person, you're still in bondage to sin. And that's why the scripture says, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So God, in his righteousness, must judge sin. If a person dies in their sin, they must be judged by the holy justice of God. There's no way out of it. Acts 17 And verse 30 says this. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance to all the world, in that he has raised him from the dead. It is unbelievable. Philosophy, being a great thinker, doing things in the greatest expectation for your race, for your people, for your nation, for your group, for society, will not merit you the salvation of God. And we have had and still do have many of men and women on this planet or lived, had lived on this planet who did outstanding great deeds for their particular race, people, for their country, for their nation, for their government, for themselves, for their family. But he still insists that all men repent. The geniuses of your intelligence, the great endeavor that you sought to free your people, to give certain rights to people of various colors or gender or nationality, does not have anything to do with the salvation of God. You must repent of your sins from the highest office in your country, my country, to the lowest. God calls all men to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world through that man whom he has signified and raised from the dead. That's why we declared in our morning worship this past Sunday that some of the most outstanding religious, governmental, sociology, educators, men and women who have done great, they cannot bring about salvation is only through Jesus. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus Christ the Messiah. The word Christ is the Messiah. Unless we come to that point 
and recognize that we are lost without Jesus. We will die in our sins. So the consideration is, is that we're due, due punishment because of our sin. And the only way out of it is through Jesus. I am the, Jesus says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, they shall be saved. So, as we so stated in our three verses of scriptures in John chapter 6, the heart of the natural man, which is desperately wicked, the mind which is so dull, does not have the spiritual capability or ability to come to God. Unless a person is born again. Born again means, this is what it means, it is when the power of God causes a lost sinner to come to grips with their sin, not sins, but with their sin, the Holy Spirit moves within their heart and convicts them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. When that happens, the gospel is spoken to them. They receive the truth and repent of their sins and trust Jesus as their Savior. That's the only way. That's why this salvation is so looked over and ignored. Because many of men are not telling people in the pews, Sunday after Sunday, repent. That word is not in the mouth, not in the lips of many preachers, sad to say, on Sunday morning. Repent. Because you cannot come to God, you cannot love God, you cannot know God. Unless the Father draws you through the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no willingness to come to Christ. We do not have a willingness to come to Christ. As so stated, We do not have the ability to come to God. So when we ask the question, how can God hold the sinner responsible for failing to do what he is unable to do? Unable, he's not capable, he cannot enter the kingdom. It's because you need to be born again. And born again means that the Holy Spirit of God convicts you of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. When that happens, you recognize and realize that you are lost. You call upon the name of the Lord through repentance and faith in Him and you get saved. So we do have a responsibility because we have a sin problem. We do have a sin problem. We are going to try and close this out with the sovereignty of God and human responsibility because the scriptures declare that through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he died. Now let's make one more thing before we close out. I, I, I don't want to miss this. In John chapter uh, 6. Okay? Because I, I don't think we made plain. I think we, when we said in John 6, go back there in John chapter 6, verse 33. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Okay, remember we went back to John 3.16, we explained who the, who the world is. The scriptures interprets the scriptures. 
For so long we've been thinking, and it's been preached and taught in churches, that everyone is going to get saved, that God loves everybody. That God loves everybody. And that he died on the cross for everybody. But let's look what the scripture says. Verse 33. He gives, his, his, he gives life to the world. So what is the world? If it's not everybody, what it means? Well, let's keep on reading. Let's, we're going to have to keep on reading until we get to uh, verse 53 and following because that's where the answers is going to lie. Let's, let's go. Verse 34. Sir, they says, always give us this bread. Jesus says, I am the, the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me will never hunger, and whosoever believes in me will never thirst. See, that's your world. See that? See that word in verse uh, 34? Whosoever comes to me will never hunger and, and or, or, or thirst. Hunger and whosoever, there it is again, believes in me will never thirst. Okay, so that's the world. So the world is an individual who has a hunger for God. The world is the individual or whoever that comes to him and has a thirst for God. But now back that up now. Watch this now. The scriptures is speaking. This is what the scriptures are saying. How can a person hunger for God? How can a person thirst for God? Did not the scripture says that we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity? So how can a person that is rooted in sin, born in sin, depraved, thirst and hunger for God? That's impossible. This is the job of the preacher to let them know, that people know, that God, this is why Jesus says in verse 37, all those that the Father gives me will come to me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw them. So you see, in order for you to have a hunger for God, in order for you to have a thirst which naturally we don't have that ability. Morally, we don't have that ability. So where do we get it from? God. See, that's why salvation has to be all of God. To God be the glory. He initiates salvation. He draws a person. He chooses a person. He saves a person. He keeps a person. Everything has to be of God. That's why to God be the glory. To him be the praise. And that's why we can say hallelujah. Praise God for him being the almighty God. Jonah 2 and 9, salvation is of the Lord. Okay. Because our motives are bad. Well, I, motives are bad or sinful in the sight of God when it comes to spiritual things. Morally, yes, we have some great ideals and we do things to help people, morally speaking. Naturally, we do. But when it comes to the kingdom of God going to heaven, being saved, salvation, we do not have the spiritual ability. We must be born again. Because in our first birth, we obtain natural ability, moral ability from our parents, from our ancestors, accessory. These things cannot save us. Being born in a king family, a rich family, a poverty family, a whatever kind of educated family, Growing up, getting education, career, naturally, morally, that is outstanding. You should do it. You need to do it. But do not think that those things can take you to heaven. So every 
center is responsible for their sin because you're born in sin. So you cannot stand before God at the judgment day and say, well, Lord, it's not my fault, and why, why, why should I be condemned for what Adam did or something I'm not able to do? God says, well, you're born in sin. Well, that's not my fault. God says you're born in sin and you're shaped in iniquity. So many excuses will be given out at that at that day but none will suffice God next week we're going to look at the sovereignty of God and prayer we're going to look at the sovereignty of God and prayer how that as especially as the believer in Christ we're focusing on the believer in Christ because we already dealt with the prayer uh, that a person needs to as far as pray to God and say, forgive me of my sin. I'm not talking about the prayer sinners of repentance and the prayer of repentance. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a recognition that you are lost and you're crying out to God. That's the matter of prayer that I'm talking about. Not something on the end of a card, on the back of a track, or a preacher gives an altar call and tells you to come up. That's, that's not even biblically. Biblical. So we're going to look at the sovereignty of God in prayer, and uh, we're going to look at some truths concerning that. Let's look at, let's bow our heads in prayer. If you are not saved, there's a warning, there's an urgency for you to seek the Lord while he can be found, and call upon his near, name while he is near. Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. Because the time is drawing closer than what you think you imagine. And your lifespan will be cut off one day. And you're going to face God. You're going to face Him. Without the forgiveness of your sins, you will hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. After all that religious showboating, church activities, great deeds to, to humanity that you have done. And you have done some great things. You got the Oscar, the Mo Nobel Peace Prize, you got wealth, power, position, and yet when you stand before God, you have to give an account of your sin. That's the question. You've got to give account of your sin before God. What are you going to do? Father, I pray, O oh God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you will save mighty men, mighty women, those who have a, a, a mighty power over their audience through records, through music, through movies, through sports, through action, through words, through speech, through politics, cause them to hear the message. Cause the Holy Spirit to convict them of their sin. Cause the rich, the poor, the Jew, the Gentile, the religious, the non-religious, the churchgoer, the non-churchgoer, the selfish, the pride, the proud, whosoever they are. Cause your spirit to convict in the heart of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. We ask this, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This Sunday, our Lord's willing, amen, is the Lord's day. And we're hoping that you'll gather with the saints of God.
on this Lord's Day to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. We'll be back on Sunday morning at uh, 9 o'clock, 8.45, for our family hour of issues dealing with the family. Then at uh, 10 o'clock, dealing with Sunday school, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important. Then at 11.30 as our family worship, 4.30 will be our biblical eldership class. Then at 5.30 will be our evening service as we try to close out chapters uh, 14 and 15 of the book of Revelation as we move through the expository preaching in the book of Revelation. God bless you. Good night, everybody. All right.